Hello, everybody, and welcome into another season preview show here at the Hockey Writers YouTube channel. And we are up to the Winnipeg Jets here as we continue to count down the days until the regular season begins. We are close to preseason now. And I've got to Brian Finlayson here, who covers the Jets here at the Hockey Writers. Uh, Brian, how's it going? I'm doing great. You know, it was almost fitting. Uh, training camp got underway yesterday, and yesterday was the first real day with a bit of a fall twinge in the air. So um, it, it was as if uh, the weather knew that it was time to get hockey underway. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, it's a uh, it's long off season. A uh, lot. I mean, there were just a few teams that really were busy after July 1st. I uh, like all the free big free agents went on pretty much the first couple days, actually the first day, really. Uh, and then uh, it went quiet for about a month. And then all of a sudden you got the Oilers and the Blues and a bunch of other stuff kind of happening uh, in August. And then, yeah, now we're up to September and we still have some stuff that the Jets still need to get done. And we'll talk about that. Um, but let's uh, let's start with the forwards and we'll start with Cole Perfetti because he is still unsigned as we're recording this training camps open. He's not there. I are you concerned at all with uh, Perfetti not being signed at, at this point? I wasn't really until recently where it sounded as if they were a little bit further apart than I thought they were. Um, there's a lot of comparables out there now. Like I've heard a lot about the Shane Pinto deal. Now, just yesterday, uh, you know, Dawson Mercer signs in uh, New Jersey. Uh, there's, you know, even like something like the uh, Dylan Gunther signing in Utah. Like you've got all these different contracts for young players who, um, you know, aside from someone like, uh, you know, Mercer, who has had some, you know, time in the NHL and has, has been successful. A lot of these guys still have a lot to prove. So I wasn't overly worried until I heard that there was some discrepancies on what they were looking for. It sounds like Perfetti was looking for a long-term deal. Sounds like the Jets are looking for a bridge deal. <laughs> And it sounds like there's a bit of a, a money difference there as well. So combining that together, unfortunately, it appears we're getting one of those little standoffs. That being said, it's weird, though, because it seems very amicable. It doesn't seem mm -hmm. like there's any sort of animosity there. It seems very friendly. The way that both sides are talking about the whole thing is very weird at this point in the offseason because it seems like they're still so like willing to be, you know, partners in this whole process right. but there still hasn't been a contract signed perfetti was the representative at the nhl media tour he was doing all these different things in a jets jersey you'd think that it'd be signed by now but yeah we've just wrapped up day two of training camp and uh yeah he's not there <laughs> yeah i mean it's always tough when it goes into the you know training camp and close to preseason he potentially could miss some preseason games i i mean he's not training i mean he's not practicing with the team it, it's kind of hard when you're when you're an RFA and not being able to, you know, prepare the same way as you do every season. Um, I mean, are you worried that he, I mean, even if he does sign, he will, I'm, not, I'm assuming he'll, he'll sign before the season, but are you concerned with potentially him being maybe behind the eight ball to start the season? Cause he's going to be a big part of this team in the top six. Yeah. And I mean, the longer this goes, the worse it is for Perfetti, who last year had a very up and down year, started off really strong, had, you know, a, he was a little bit of an iffy middle of the season and then spent a lot of time in the press box in the back half and into the playoffs. So this was really a prove it year for him, regardless of what that contract situation was. And if he comes out with a slow start, it's not a good thing for him, especially if he signs a bridge deal. Mm -hmm. If the first half of his bridge deal is essentially, you know, a write off because he came in and he had to get up to speed. Uh, it's, it's only going to hurt him contract wise, maybe confidence wise, maybe perception from the, the new coaching staff too, because clearly mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of, you know, trust from Rick bonus in him last season. There was a lot of situations where he'd be on that second line. He'd be in the top six, but the second it hits 10 minutes on the clock in the third in a close game, Perfetti wouldn't be nowhere to be seen mm. because Bonus didn't trust him along the walls in those defensive battles, uh, despite him being actually quite a good defensive player. <laughs> but we don't necessarily know the philosophy from Scott Arneal. It's his first year actually behind the bench. It's his team now. Um, but it's going to be interesting. If the longer this drags on, I would worry that his slow start is only going to be a detriment to both himself and the fact that they were trusting him to come back in and be that second line guy. Mm -hmm. And if he's not able to do that, I think the Jets are, you know, looking for answers there. Well, we'll just have to wait and see and, and of how uh, how long it is. And I mean, 
I'm hoping, I mean, everyone's probably hoping that it's in the next few days and that he can, you know, start joining training camp, preseason games and all that, and it shouldn't be too bad, but um, we'll wait and see. Look at the rest of the forwards, though. I mean, there wasn't many changes at all. I mean, they didn't really add anyone. Um, they're hoping that their additions from last season, like Gabe Velarde, get have a full season without injuries because he was really good in the games that he did play. Uh, yeah. And he'll set to be on that top line with Shifley and Connor again here. Uh, Nick Ehlers, there's some stuff around him too uh, because he he's nearing the end of his net contract. Uh, right now, Vlasov Nemestikov is pretty set as being the second line center. You know, how, how, what do you think about this forwards? I mean, is it good enough from last season? I mean, Sean Monaghan was really good when he came over after the trade deadline, but of course he's in Columbus now. Um, are you concerned at all with anything in the forward group right now? I'm concerned with two things, one of which being the expectations that have been set from the success of last year. And for the most part, as you said, the forwards are relatively untouched. And that pressure now is so high on them to try and find that same level of performance that put them fourth in the NHL last season. And I, 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 I think the funniest thing was I know it's hockey season because day one of training camp hit, Scott O'Neill rolled out Connor Shifley Velarde and the entirety of Jets Twitter freaked out because historically <laughs> Connor Shifley with someone who's not Nikolai Ehlers have been historically not great together. Mm. And that we saw that down the stretch a lot. But I, I honestly think that when you run a line that much historically, especially those two, it's a comfort thing to get mm. everyone sort of into the groove of thing and uh, of uh, training camp there. So that. I'm curious to see how that shakes out because at the top line going into the season is Connor Shifley Velarde. I'm more concerned than I would be if say it was, even if it was Connor Shifley Ehlers mm. or, um, you know, Shifley Ehlers and Velarde, they had a lot of success. Um, but I think that second line though is probably the most interesting talking point because there was some legitimate discussions about what, role uh brad lambert could play mm. and, you know he was just on the all rookie team with uh, the manitoba moose in the ahl and a lot of people were wondering is this the year that he takes that step and at least for the first two days of training camp he's skating on a line with guys that are almost guaranteed to not make the nhl and he hasn't been given a shot to play next to nikolai ehlers yet um so at least on the surface level and things could change especially as games happen because if he has a massive game maybe he gets more of a look but at least at this point, it appears that the offensive talents of Brad Lambert will start in the AHL. And I do wonder if that's also because they don't see him at center, at least at this point, and they don't want to move Nemestikov. But I honestly think it's actually a better thing for him if they were planning on moving him to the wing to not do it at all and send him mm -hmm. down because he was actually struggling a lot, uh, you know, in that, that winger position there. And he was excelling in the AHL at center, but you know, the bottom six is unchanged. You're going to have Adam Lowry centering that third line. You're going to have Mason Appleton and Nino Niederreiter on that side. And then probably a rotating cast of guys on that fourth line, which they've had for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So the forward core is going to be something I want to watch because one injury though, I, I don't really know what their plan is. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, the Mesnikov is, is shown to be a pretty good uh, forward. I don't know if he's a legitimate second line center. Uh, he's, he's shown flashes of a lot of talent wherever he's been. Um, but he's a very versatile guy. He can go up and down the lineup. He, you know, but I don't know if he's really a second line center on a real, on a contender. That's, I think for me, I'm not looking at the depth chart. I, mean, I don't know Nemestikov there, but um, right now that's where he is. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right, yeah. let's uh, move to the defense uh, again. Uh, not really any changes. There were some subtractions, though. Uh, Brendan Dillon no longer on the team. Uh, but they do still have the main guy, Josh Morrissey, who's uh, turned into a legitimate top pairing defenseman, um, potentially an even Norris Trophy worthy type guy. All right, you still got the, the guys, Dylan DeMello, uh, Neil Pionk, you know, those types of guys. Colin Miller's going to have a full season with the team. Uh, what do you think about this decor? I was feeling a little bit better about the upside of it until about noon today. Um, because news dropped that uh Vili Hainala, who has uh you know been the guy who's always been on the cusp of making the NHL team, he's been outstanding with the Manitoba Moose, he's one of their top prospects, and 
you know, he's getting a little bit older now and it felt like, so Brendan Dillon, he departs, Nate Schmidt is bought out. Um, maybe this is his chance to finally step in. And I actually thought uh, before anything even happened that Colin Miller and Billy Hanela would work really well as a pairing mm -hmm. because of their two styles. They would work well together. We just came down today that the surgically repaired ankle that he, uh, after he broke it last training camp, after he had apparently made the team, uh, that surgically repaired ankle has an infection in it, oh. in the uh, the area in which the screw is, I guess, put in. And essentially what Scott Arneal said was, uh, it's not short term. Um, and that throws my confidence in sort of the, the makeup of this defensive mm -hmm. group a little bit lower because it felt like with a Vili Hainala being in the mix and having a bit more of a dynamic third pairing that you can maybe, you know, take advantage of playing against the other team's third pairing. You have a bit more of an upside without that. You're lo likely looking at a Logan Stanley stepping in there. Maybe someone like a Dylan Coughlin who they brought in mm -hmm. or a Hayden flurry. These guys who have kind of been those, those role guys uh, on wherever team they've been on, but you know, you're going to have to lean again, a lot on Josh Morrissey and Dylan DeMello. And obviously DeMello just signed his new contract this off season. You're probably going to see more of a top four role for Dylan Sandberg, mm -hmm. who, as really he's prospered in that third pairing, he, him and Nate Schmidt, when they were together on that pairing were some of the best, they didn't do anything offensively, but they also didn't allow anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were really, really good at that. Uh, and maybe he can help tame Neil Pionk a little bit because Pionk is very chaotic, especially when he's trying to, you know, move the puck up. So hoping that a little bit, that sort of defensive stalwart of uh, Sandberg, not being that major offensive contributor can kind of help, back that up so it's not going to be all on someone else to try and figure that out. Losing Brendan Dillon is tough because one, you lose a a great locker room guy. Everyone mm -hmm. loved him. Someone who can really sort of, you know, mix it up as well, but someone who's just really good on the defensive end. And he actually, he tapped into some offensive skill last year that he hasn't done since junior. You had, mm -hmm. I think eight goals last season. So you're missing some key parts. And then to not have that upside of a Billy Hainel, it's uh it's it's looking a little bit tougher for them to be difference makers. Hanel has been a really polarizing prospect too. I, he's he's not developed as I think people was expect were expecting when he was drafted. Um, this season, like you said, was going to hopefully be the good time that he makes the team full time and he becomes a regular NHLer. But now that injury that's that's going to throw a big wrench into it. Uh, and who knows, like you say, don't know how long he's going to be out. And when he comes back, you know, he's going to have to start from zero again. That's going to be interesting to see. So yeah, th this defense is going to be interesting. I, I think, especially with the, the subtractions, uh, Nate Schmidt, even though he was overpaid, probably he was still a pretty good defenseman yeah. uh, for the team. So, I mean, losing him, that's going to be interesting to see how they kind of fill it. I like Colin Miller. I think he's going to be really good. Um, he was good in the limited time. I think what did he only play like five games or something like that? May have been less. It was kind of weird. Like they paid the assets to get him, and then he just didn't play down the stretch. Yeah. And then he played in the final playoff game where they lost. It was the same thing with Perfetti, where they were both sat down the stretch, put in in the final game of their season, and then that was it. Yeah. So I mean, uh, well, I mean Miller, of course, resigned, and he wants to be here. So I, uh, I think he's he's still a very solid veteran. He can slot in on the power play with that big shot that he's got. Uh, he's not the offensive guy that he used to be uh, in Vegas, but uh, that's, I think he he's still a pretty good addition uh, or I guess continuing <laughs> yeah. from last season. <laughs> All right. Uh, goaltending. Now this is where there's no question marks uh, for the starter. Call Connor Hellebuck is back. He's uh, probably a, still at his peak uh, of his career where he was a Vesna trophy winner. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, but they do have a b new backup, uh, Capo Kakinen taking over for Laurent Brassois. I, I mean, he's bounced around now. He was in Minnesota and then he went to, it was in San Jose and then he went to New Jersey. I, and now he's in Winnipeg. So where do you see this tandem? Of course, Hellebuck's going to play most of the time, but, uh, how do you, what do you think about the addition of Kakinen? I actually, I really like it. Um, that's interesting too, because just before that, they also brought back a very familiar face in Eric Comrie, who has been in and out of the organization since essentially, I think 2013. Um, and I'm assuming that he's going to be that first man up from the, uh, the AHL, probably be that, that guy to help the AHL, you know, 
goaltending. Mm -hmm. I was going to say like pipeline. Cause there's a few guys that like there's Thomas Millich who is very young, but he's, he developed really nicely last season. And you're going to have a guy maybe later on, maybe Dom DiVincentis come over. So that's a good thing for Comer to be, but he's also Comer's played NHL games and meaningful mm -hmm. NHL games, you know, over the last few seasons. And, you know, they're very familiar with his style. He's worked with Wade Flaherty before the goaltending coach. So he's going to be probably that guy who will step in if maybe there's some struggling from Kakinen or, uh, you know, if maybe there's an injury. But uh, Kakinen is a very intriguing goalie to me because on paper, the base level stats don't look impressive, especially when he was in San Jose. But when you look at that San Jose team and what they gave up, yeah. he actually really wasn't all that bad. And, you know, to be sort of, you know, essentially above water at all on those teams where they would give up everything and even just making it so that not everything was going in. It, it, it was a real sort of test of sort of where he was mentally. And then in his little time in Jersey there, when he was acquired uh, in the, uh, the trade deadline, he, uh, he looked solid. Like mm -hmm. it, it was someone who he didn't play a lot, but he did, you know, well in the minutes that he was in the crease there. So I, I honestly think that, he, he might not be a Laurent Brassois who, you know, they become the best tandem in the league and they win the Jennings. But I think that he could be solid enough that you're not dreading the fact that Hellebuck has to take a yeah. night off like <laughs> we've had in the past, like, you know, even a couple of years back with David Riddick. And then there was, um, you know, points where you wanted Hellebuck to take a night off when we had Comrie a few years back. And, you know, Comrie ended up not getting to his uh, his point in his season where he could play enough games. And then he became a UFA and then signed with Buffalo. So it feels like kind of a uh, a weird little carousel there, but it's nice to have the depth and then also the youth that can be developed uh, where it, the goaltending pipeline for the Jets hasn't really been overly successful since uh, you know developing Hellebuck. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great to have Hellebuck there. It, it's, he's he's as, as solid as he as he can get uh, in in goal. So I mean, it's not when he's in there, you don't worry about it. Uh, and Kakinen, I think he he's of course was playing for a bad team. So I mean that those numbers are inflated, but he's a very talented goalie. He was one of the probably the, the Wild's goaltender of the future for a while uh, until he was traded, and and that was because there were some other developments in their system. Uh, and I think Kakinen can still be a pretty good goalie for the Jets when he has to step in. So I I think it's still going to be a really good tandem. I it just especially with how good defensively the Jets, well, thinking will continue to be uh, from last season, right? All right, uh, let's uh, talk about the division. Uh, I mean, the Central Division is stacked at the top. I mean, the Jets are, you know, they're still pretty solid in, in that range. You got the Colorado Avalanche, you've got the Dallas Stars. The National Predators are probably going to take a huge step forward this season with their additions. Uh, where do you see the Jets? Are they still in that top tier? I think they compete for a division spot for sure. I think they might this season, they'll be closer to teetering between division and wild card than they were last year. But, you know, they finished second in the central last season. You know, they were battling it out, you know, with Dallas and Colorado down the stretch for, you know, essentially the, the back three months of the season. Yeah. So, I, I'm anticipating that battle to be, you know, continuing. But I, I have to say that you know, on paper at least, uh, and, you know, having to try and replicate that success, I don't necessarily see them being right on par with a Dallas. Uh, Colorado is a weird one because, you know, their goaltending situation for the last, you know, three to four years hasn't been great, but they've still managed to be very successful. So they're always a little bit interesting in terms of, you know, when is the goaltending going to collapse or mm -hmm. when is it going to stand on its head? And then you have, as you mentioned, Nashville who have, decided to spend on a bunch of veterans and kind of supplement the guys that they already had. And obviously they have a UC Soros who has been one of the best goalies in the NHL over the last few few seasons here. Um, I think they're a very interesting bunch because you bring in a lot of, you know, very notable players, but a lot of them are on that other half of 30, sometimes even, mm -hmm. you know, closer to 35 where yeah, their their leadership and their you know their skills are still very much welcomed, but there are question marks as to whether they're going to be as consistent as they have been. Like obviously, mm -hmm. I have no doubts that Steven Stamkos can still put the puck in the net, but I do have doubts that he can do it consistently throughout the season and stay healthy. Mm -hmm. That's been a problem for him. You know, a Jonathan Marchessault, I think he'll have a good season. I feel like he's still a little bit you know angry from uh, 
you know, Vegas not, you know, giving him what he was looking for. And, uh, but I, I just feel like their team is a very, it almost feels like a case study of trying to put a bunch of really good veterans who have been good and maybe still be good. And a bunch of guys who are kind of prospering a little bit in their mm. role and putting it all together. And obviously you still have, you know, like a Roman Yossi who, you know, you, you know, you're getting a lot out of him anyway. So they're, they're going to be interesting, but I think that's the team to watch if you're a Jets fan where mm. they might be that team jostling for that third position and maybe even the second. So I think essentially two, three, and then that first wild card spot, it's going to be a dogfight, I think, till the very end. And I, I think that's kind of going to be where the Jets are looking at. It's going to be a, a really interesting uh, battle at the top, I think, uh, especially when you looked at all those three teams eclipsed 100 points. Uh, and that's insane. Uh, and Nashville, even though they, they were one of the bottom teams and making the playoffs, they still had quite a few points. And now they've added a lot more offense, but it is going to be interesting how Stamkos and Marchessault will kind of fit in there. I, I mean, you on paper there, you, it looks like they're just going to be a high powered top six, but you don't know how, how fit, how they're going to fit in and all that. Right. And I totally forgot that Marcia. So actually was in Tampa Bay uh, way back. Yeah. <laughs> it actually was Stamkos was there with them. I, I totally just blanked my mind when they're saying, Oh, they're reuniting. I'm like, Wait, what do you mean? But yeah, he was in Tampa Bay a long time ago. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that team kind of gels. And that that is going to be a big question of where the Jets kind of fit. If they take that step, the Jets are going to have to kind of be in that wild card spot and see how it goes. All right, well, before we move to a quick fire, we got to talk about Scott Arnell because, uh, I mean, he is a new head coach. I mean, he is was the assistant coach before, so he's not really new to the organization. But like you said, he's now taking over the systems while before he was just following Rick Bonus's lead. I do you see the team playing the same type of style as uh as Bonus, but as very good defensively. Uh, they could score goals, of course, but their main staple was being that solid, really good defensive team. Do you see a shift in style with Arnell now uh, in the lead? I think that you're going to see aspects of the bonus game. I, I think because that was the thing because Arneal was part of that defensive coaching group. He coached that. He coached the penalty kill, and you know, now that he's moving into that head coaching role and more of a facilitator, I think you're going to see things that he's pulled from what was successful. But I also think he knows that that team wasn't able to get over the hump. So I think he'll pull maybe some of his offensive, uh, you know, instincts, find something that works. I know he said a lot of the you know the right things early on. He's they had, you know, a coaching and analytics summit to try and understand what they're, you know, falling behind on. And a lot of other teams who are successful are using numbers to their advantage and figuring out less so about what they're doing right and more so about what other teams are doing right and figure out how you can exploit their weaknesses and what they're maybe not doing as well. And I think that was key. And then to have him say so many great things about the, you know, the young players and the organization and to have them maybe being a, a role on this team, it feels like that was a little bit more of a step outside of what Bonus's philosophy mm -hmm. for, philosophy was. Young players didn't necessarily seem to be in the overall plan, and to have you know him talk so highly of Cole Perfetti, so highly of a Billy um, you know these guys who are you know we're looking to step in. Obviously, Hanela is a different story now. And then, you know, to mention some guys by name as well, and you know, who are maybe in juniors for another year or in the AHL, it, it felt very much like a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of fans, after what they've seen over the last few years, and they haven't won a playoff round since 2017. Um, you know, I, 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 they've won one since 2017. Sorry. Um, they want to see the action. They want to yeah. see his, you know, ideas of, okay, I saw what didn't work last year. Let's try something different. I people want to see his adaptability. I think that was the biggest issue with Rick Bonus is during games, uh, he didn't have the ability to properly adapt to what the other team was doing. Like there were certain games where, you know, you'd see the other team struggle early on against the Jets, and then they would call a timeout or they'd have the intermission. They'd come back and they would be a di totally different team. You never saw that out of the Jets. There was always the same thing from them. And I think that the key to Arneal's success is having a better handle on the in-game adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, because if he does that, I have a feeling he'll definitely be in uh, fans' favor because that was such a, a huge issue for them last year. 
Yeah, I mean, what's good is that he's he's not coming into a new thing. I mean, he's been here for a while. He actually was, well, interim, interim. I mean, he took over for a bit there while uh, Bonus was away from the team. So, I mean, and, you know, so he's used to the assist, the group, right? And that and that's a big thing. Um, I, I, he was in Vancouver for a while too. So, I mean, he, he is, I, I actually was happy that they hired him as head coach because I think he has a lot of, uh, potential to be a really good. Um, I mean, he was head coach in Columbus uh, for a bit there, but I think he's a better coach now. And I think to take over a team. So we'll see. I think, it, I think it's going to be good though. Yeah. And a lot of Jets fans know him too, because he coached the, I mean, the, the Canucks, uh, affiliate for some yeah. years when they were the Manitoba Moose, and you know he was there. He was also a member of the Manitoba Moose. Like he he is, has such a, a sort of a hockey history in the city that it's more than just him being named head coach. And it's more so. I feel like a lot of fans too that made a lot of you know, it both made sense, but it also was okay. Let's see him succeed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just going to feel like another sort of legacy hire. Right. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, we'll see. I, I think I think it's going to be good, though, because, like you said, there's some good signs already as uh, as training camp started here. And we'll just have to, <laughs> of course, wait and see and, and uh, how it all goes. All right, let's do our quick fire round here. And these are all just uh, quick uh, questions that just a sentence or two answer here. Um, so we'll start with our first one here. What's the biggest storyline or question mark for the Jets going into this season? I think it's going to be essentially Cole Perfetti in the second line. Who's going to be on that line? When's he going to sign? Is he going to look good? You know, and how's Arneal going to use him? Uh, that second line, I think, is key uh, to establishing the trust of that forward group. Yeah, I think that's the biggest one for sure, uh, especially until Perfetti signs and uh, how that all goes after that. All right, uh, one or two breakout stars for this season. Uh, I think the one for me that really stands out is uh, Dylan Sandberg. He's stepping into the top four. He's been on that third pairing and then occasionally stepped into the top four, whether it be injury or a Brendan Dylan suspension. He's been the next man up. And I think that this is his chance to really show I belong as a top four defenseman in the NHL. And I, I think he's kind of the one that I'm really looking forward to. Billy Hanelow was my other one, but we don't really know when he's going to start yeah. a season. Well, we're hope hopefully it's not going to be too long, but I mean, infections are, are, you don't know. Yeah. I mean, that it's something that it depends on how bad it was and how long it'll take to recover from, from it. All right. Ta, who needs to bounce back from last season? I, I think the easy answer uh, is Neil Pionk. Neil Pionk had one of the sort of more abysmal seasons as that he's had since he's been here. And it just felt like every time he, he touched the puck, things weren't going his way. And, you know, a lot of stuff was happening, you know, for him on and off the ice. And, you know, he had some, some struggles in terms of his, his breakout passes. He also had some stuff where, you know, he was away from the team for a little bit to uh, attend the funeral of Adam Johnson. You could mm -hmm. tell it was really affecting him later on, but to have that, I also think too, someone that I really need to see more from this year uh, is Mark Shifley. Because that that center core is just not really good enough to be that number one Stanley Cup contender. Mm -hmm. And to have him as your number one, he was, you know, he had moments where he looked like himself from, you know, that 2017, 18, 19 sort of stretch there where he was legitimately discussed as a top center in the league. I need to see at least something closer to that for me to feel a bit more confidence in that center group. <laughs> For sure. I mean, he's the only one that's that legit top six center I that you definitely say, yeah, when you say Shifley's name, yeah, he's one of the top centers in the league. But yeah, last season, he probably wasn't, he didn't perform to that level. And uh, he definitely can do it. We've seen it in the past. All right. Uh, an X factor for this season. It doesn't have to be a, pr a player per se, but it could, it could be a situation too. What do you got for an X factor? I think two things stand out. One is how much of that defensive structure sticks around because if you can manage to keep some of that intact, I think that is key to my second X factor, which is how many games does Connor Hellebuck have to play? Yeah. And uh, if Connor Hellebuck is one, he's I, I down the stretch, he was still facing a lot of shots, but he was at his absolute best. Um, 
But I think if you can maintain a decent defensive structure and then keep him, you know, fresh, make it so he's not having to save 40 shots a night and then have it so like a Capo Kakinen can step in and actually be the guy to back him up. I think that's going to be key to figuring out sort of how far this team can go because if Hellebuck has to carry the entirety of the load and the defensive structure isn't exactly what it used to be, it's going to feel a lot closer to, you know, the 2021s, the 2022s rather than last year where, you know, it felt like they were destined for something greater than what they resulted in. Yeah. There were so many years Hellebuck was first or second in, uh, in high danger chances against and, insane amount of shots again so i mean he can't be happy to deal with that i he was probably really happy last season he didn't have to have to face that many um so yeah that's a that's a big key for uh, for the success this season for sure all right let's talk about uh rookies prospects uh, of course they've got a, a new guy uh in brayden yeager uh, coming in but um do you see anyone surprising and making the team out of training camp uh, there's two, and I mentioned them already, but Brad Lambert, I think, has the skill to kind of wow the coaching staff into saying, hey, let's give this guy a shot in the NHL. Uh, he has taken such incredible strides as a player in the last you know, calendar year, even, where he started last season with the, the Manitoba Moose at center. And this this came after two where he struggled quite a bit, and he actually they moved him over to Seattle in the WHL to try and kickstart him again. He now has a full season under his belt. He has an all rookie team nomination. He he you know, was fantastic last season. I think that he has the skill to wow the coaching staff uh, into maybe earning a spot out of camp. And I think it would be on that second line because nothing else really makes sense for it. And then someone else that I keep an eye on is Elias Salmonson, who uh, has he's making his first foray over to North America now in terms of his actual game times. He's been playing over in Sweden. He has been fantastic uh with Skeleftia there and he his coaching staff essentially said I've never seen anyone develop this quickly and you know he's a lot bigger than I think people give him credit for so he I think he's going to adapt well to the physicality of the North American game I think if he can adjust the ice quick enough he might be an x factor down the stretch depending on sort of injuries and everything but I, I think that he's got enough just outright skill and skating ability and puck moving ability that he could legitimately make an impact on the NHL team. I think as early as late this year, if not next year. I mean, there's definitely some kind of movement. Like you said, the fourth line is, is going to be a rotating kind of thing. So, I mean, there's probably some room in the bottom six to maybe uh, have some of these guys make it. Um, but we'll see how they play in preseason and all that. There's just one more name. I, I realized yeah. I forgot to mention him. Um, Nikita Chibrikov. I'm not going to say much oh, about him because, yeah. you know, every, everyone has kind of figured it out. He is feisty. He is skilled. He is very fast. And he's going to make everyone's life a nightmare on the ice because he's always stirring something up. I think he's the perfect fit on maybe a third line. Maybe he's someone who can beat, you know, Mason Appleton mm. out of a role there. Uh, I think he's someone to keep an eye on too in camp, especially if he's stirring it up with everyone, essentially. <laughs> for sure. Those guys are always have a chance of making teams out of training camp because they're, they're noticeable, right? All right. Outside of players that can make the team, I, who should everyone be watching prospect wise? I mean, mentioned Braden Yeager uh, acquired much more majority trade. Uh, who, who should everyone be watching? I think, yeah, outside of the ones who could really make noise in the NHL camp, I, I would definitely keep an eye on someone like Colby Barlow. Um, oh, yeah. He has, I, th I think he's had a bit of a slower development curve than what people were really hoping for early on. And I think this season's really big in terms of him taking that next step as a prospect into someone who is just a prospect too. This is someone who could make the team or at least make some noise professionally next year. Um, I, I, I like his shot. And there's a few things that he needs to work on in terms of his, you know, developmental skills in terms of how plays develop. Uh, but I, I think if he puts it together, it could be really good. I, mean, I really like him as a player. I think that he has that scoring ability the Jets have lacked for you know years. And to have someone like that develop, that'd be great. But I think a lot of people want to see more from him. Uh, yeah. He was still able to score at will uh, last year, but it just felt like the rest of his game wasn't really moving along. It sounds like there's some 
some chatter about him possibly going to Oshawa in the OHL from uh, Owen Sound. It sounds like there might be a little bit of a dispute there as to whether, you know, Owen Sound is the best place for that development. And, you know, maybe that changes things. But no, I, I definitely would keep an eye on him because if he manages to develop the sort of, you know, edges of his game there where he isn't just the shot, uh, I think that he could be someone who was going to jump up the prospect rankings in the next year. I see a lot of uh, leadership, a, a guy that could potentially be a captain uh, in the future too. I, I don't know if for the Jets, but I think he definitely can be that type of uh, leader in the future. Um, but yeah, I really like him as a prospect too. All right, uh, let's get a couple predictions here. Uh, who is going to lead the team in scoring for forwards and defense? There's some obvious ones, uh, obvious, but, but who do you have uh, leading the way? Uh, forward group, I, I feel like in terms of going with the trends of where it's been, I think it's going to be Kyle Connor again. You know, he's if he stays healthy, he's almost a guaranteed 35 to 40 goals. And, you know, being on a line with the Mark Shifley and, you know, depending on who else the other line mate is, he's probably going to be able to do some, you know, some assist work as well. So I could see him somewhere between 70 and 80 points again. Mm -hmm. He's been right around there for, you know, the better part of the last five years. And you know, he missed a lot of time last year, but if he has a full season, it, it, I could see him pushing 40, if not even closer to 50 goals. And then defensively, there is absolutely no question. It's yeah. going to be Josh Morrissey. He has been one of the more dominant offensive forces on the blue line over the past three years here. So, you know, he has been everything the Jets have needed him to be and more. And, you know, him and Dylan DeMello have become this great pairing together. And I, I think that he's just going to continue to just, be himself and that can only help the jets yeah i mean he took a little step back but not much i mean it, it's uh like what seven points like not, yeah. nothing really um well eight points but i mean that i think he just didn't score as much he didn't score uh he had almost the same amount of assists he just didn't score uh six less he scored six fewer goals <laughs> and he's got to yeah. score a bit more this season um <laughs> but yeah it, he's he's just become that quintessential top pairing defenseman and i think there, there's no one else that's going to touch his point totals that's for sure all right to finish the show let's uh get a bold prediction or a hot take for this season for the jets bold prediction i would say brad lambert whether it be by injury or by performance or whatever circumstance is going to be playing in the top six by christmas I, I think that he might be the Kyle Connor situation where Kyle Connor looked to be close to making the team out of camp when he was in his rookie year, got sent down, played 10 games or less than 10 games with the Moose, got called back up and he's never been sent down since. So <laughs> I, I have a feeling that in terms of if, if Lambert can pick up where he left off last season, he's going to be knocking at the door almost immediately. And I think that if they struggle right off the bat, I think there might be a willingness or if someone gets hurt, uh, or if maybe a Perfetti isn't up to speed yet. Mm. Um, I think that he is that next option. And I, I think there are some questions as to whether he can be in that role. But I will also remind people that their second line played third line minutes last year mm. because uh, Rick Bonus trusted that Adam Lowry line so much that he was they were playing the second amount of forward minutes. So mm -hmm. I think that Lambert playing technically, if that's the same layout, which I don't know if it is because it's Arneal, um, if that's the same level and he's playing like third line minutes, I think he has the chance to be a legitimate, you know, rookie threat. Mm -hmm. I've always loved Lambert. I think uh, obviously in his draft year, he dropped off uh, from where everyone thought he was going to be a top like two pick uh, for a while there. And I think he's got the talent to be that top line, top six threat um, taking a little bit longer than anticipated but I think he'll get there and this season could be it, right? He's taking, making a lot of strides and definitely has the skill set to do it. So he'll be one to watch for sure. All right. Well, thanks Brian for, uh, for coming on talking the jets as we get ready for the season. Um, you know, it's going to be exciting. I think the jets have still a pretty good team, even though they're second beyond the top line, maybe there's a little bit of question marks there. But uh, I think I think there's still going to be a really good uh, squad this season. So uh, make sure to check out everything at hotbears.com for our preview stuff. We got tons of it coming out every day. Of course, we got all the other season preview videos. We want to take a look at those and um, and everything on the Substack as well. But 
until our next one, um, it, this may be the last one you watch, who knows, but uh, and, until our next video, we'll see you next time.